So what's true? If you get on the internet, you can find evidence and opinions on pretty much any subject from uh, one end of the, of the opinion right to the other side. And I won't even get into COVID with all that. So how do you really know sometimes what's really true? Well, it's been the position of Christianity that God has revealed and shown the truth about himself and about the world he created, including why humans even exist. And this truth is contained in writings that we claim are authored by God through the hands of people, through what we know as the Bible. So is the Bible really God's word? Is the Bible God's word? Now I wholeheartedly believe that it is. And I would like to give you a, bit of a little bit of a start as to why I believe it, and that you can believe that and trust in it as well. Because if it is true, then the Bible is a source that we can truly, that is truly worth studying and worth applying to in our lives. Now we're in the middle of a series that we've titled Living as the Church, Living as a Group of Believers, Followers of Jesus. And I include this topic because literally you can't live a Christian life as the body of Christ representing Jesus to each other and to the world without knowing and standing on the truth of God's Word. In the same rate, I can't expect anybody to either to commit their life to following Jesus either without knowing that they can depend on what God has said. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the question is, is the Bible Scripture? Well, before I answer that, what do I mean by Scripture? What is Scripture? Well, here's the dictionary definition from Webster's Dictionary. It's a body of writings that's considered sacred or authoritative. Now, obviously, there is more bodies of writings that are considered um, sacred and authoritative than just the Bible in the world. There are other religions that have what they call scripture. Sacred simply means that it's really from God. And authoritative means it bears God's authority. So people believe that whatever the writings are, that they are really from God and they bear his authority. Now, if a body of writings really is from God and bears his authority, if it really does, then it would be worth studying and worth applying in our lives, as I said before. We could use it to teach, to correct, to train in righteousness, to equip for good works. So how does something really qualify to being actually from God and bearing his authority? By whose opinion or what standard is it actually scripture? Well, I'm going to give to you the Bible as that it is unique and it stands out above every other sacred writing out there in many, many ways. To start with, the Bible, what does it claim for itself? Does it actually claim that it's God's word and that God is speaking? That's kind of important because if it doesn't claim it, doesn't claim that status, why call it God's word? And there are sacred writings out there that actually don't claim that, but are uh, determined to be scripture. But, let's go back to the beginning of 2, P 2 Timothy 3.16, which we looked at earlier. It said, all scripture is breathed out by God. Now this writer, the Apostle Paul, um, who's writing in 2 Timothy there, in the very verse before that one, in verse 15, he was talking about the Old Testament. So what he's doing is he's calling the Old Testament scripture. But he also adds why he's why he says it's scripture. He says that it's breathed out by God, which is a way of saying that God spoke it, or God originated it, God inspired it, depending on how you want to say that. Basically, God spoke it. And when you think about it, when any person speaks, as I am speaking, I have to have breath coming out of my mouth. If I don't, you're not going to hear anything. It goes across the vocal cords and you hear a sound. You hear me speaking, hopefully clearly and articulately. But either way, so when it's breathed out by God, it's saying that God is the speaker. He's the originator of the Old Testament. Now we can understand uh, how that works in, in some ways, but the thing is we know that humans actually wrote down the words of the Bible. So how does that really work? Well, this is what we read in the scripture in 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, not Timothy, 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And it says there, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, 
to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now Peter's talking about the Old Testament, the prophetic word. And he's advising that we pay attention to it. Now why? So he says in verse 20, why pay attention? Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Now when he says prophecy of Scripture, he's simply speaking about all of the Scripture in itself. Because somebody had to actually write it down and say that, hey, God said this, and that's your prophecy of Scripture. Somebody wrote it down, and it's the prophecy of Scripture. So no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now that's about as good as understanding as we can get. Basically, Peter is saying that Scripture... First of all, it does not originate with people. It's not just men's ideas that they wrote down and people said, hey, that's God's word. Uh, it's not their own interpretations, but the writers, the writers of Scripture were real people and they were carried, used somehow by the Holy Spirit to speak from God. So God was the speaker, but he used people to tell it and to write it. And as, and as you read the Bible, most books, if not all of them, the, the writer, the author is known to us. Not every single one of them. We don't know the writer of all of them. But the vast majority of them, we know the writer. The writer is usually named. And they're usually recognized as someone who was someone who spoke for God, who was a prophet. And so, but we also see unique writing styles. Uh, the Apostle Paul has a very different writing style than the Apostle John or Jeremiah or different people like that. So we see God using their personalities, but speaking through the people. In the New Testament, the writers were mostly one of the twelve apostles, um, or someone associated with an apostle, um, with the exception of the Apostle Paul, who Jesus personally commissioned, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 9. But with, with that, you also see a consistency among all those writers. There's over 30 writers throughout the whole Bible, 30 writers from beginning to end, and you think about it, the Bible was written over a 1,500 year period of time and is made up of 66 books with, again, 30 writers. And the amazing thing is, is it agrees together. It agrees with itself. How do you get over 1,500 years and 30 writers and you don't have one guy saying one thing and someone saying something else? Because, like it says, they were, they were spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God was the author. Now those authors claim in the Old Testament more than 3,800 times that God is the one who is speaking. So they say, God said. And many times, essentially, the writers quote God. And I'm giving you just a few quick examples from beginning to end. Genesis, uh, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So he's basically quoting God. Last um, book in the Old Testament is Malachi. You will tread down the wicked, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. So again, he's quoting God, saying, this is exactly what God is saying. And you'll get that right from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of it. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke the word of God just directly. This is what he said in John 7. So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. If anyone's will is to do with God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So he's saying his teaching, his speaking, is directly from God. The apostles also claimed to speak God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, this is the Apostle Paul. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but for what it really is the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. An interesting one is that the Apostle Peter called Paul's writing Scripture, 2 Peter 3, 14-16. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved, beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. As also in all his letters, speaking in them these, of these things, which in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do 
the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So he's saying, yeah, Paul can be kind of hard to understand, which if you've read Paul, you understand that there's some things that are hard to understand, some things not so bad. But he's saying, he's calling it scripture, what Paul had written. So the authors of the Bible, here's the bottom line, that the authors of the Bible claim that they are giving God's words. And that's a pretty good start, because at least uh, it's not just a religious group saying, hey, this is scripture, but it's the writings themselves claim it. The Bible also claims to have the ultimate authority of God. It claims it within itself. And here's just a few examples. One is that God's word is pure. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. So it claims that it is pure. It claims that God's word will stand forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. God's word is true. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That's Jesus speaking to the Father. God's word is also powerful and speaks truth to his people. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of the Lord is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's saying that his word can pierce right into us and we can feel it and know, oh, that's, that hurts. God is saying something to us. And it does that. Psalm 19 puts a lot of these things together. Uh, verses uh, 7 to 11. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Testimony simply means another way of saying God's word. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping of them there is great reward. So if those things are true, what it says about itself, that the Bible really is from God, then another natural assumption about the Bible is that it would also be inerrant. And that's something that, uh, theologically, we say that the, the scriptures are inerrant, which means they are perfect with no mistakes, and that's a pretty big claim. But if you think that God is perfect, and that's who God is, he does not make mistakes. But in saying that, I do have to qualify it. What, it, what we mean by that is the original writings were definitely perfect. Because, you know what, we, you know what? we do not have the original writings anymore. The stuff, the actual, the actual paper the guys wrote on and, and started with, that would be inerrant. What we have are copies of those originals and that they have been passed down to us. So we know, and, and when we know by comparing manuscripts, that there are copy errors within those manuscripts. That doesn't mean, though, that we can't know for certainty that, of what was actually written in the original. We can know with almost perfect certainty, like literally 99.99%, that what we have now is the same of what was actually written. How do we know that? Well, it's just literally the sheer number of biblical manuscripts that they have. And what they do is they compare them back and forth. And you can find errors and figure out, oh, that's an error, and these ones don't have that, and that kind of thing. So when you compare them together, scholars are able to see what the original is and what, what was original and what was not original. And that comes through the science of what we call textual criticism, examining and comparing ancient texts. And through archaeology, that has provided us many, many numbers of ancient texts for us, which I'm going to get into in just a second here. Basically, the Bible is the most strongly verified ancient document in existence. And that's a pretty exclusive statement. It is literally the most strongly ancient, ver strongly verified ancient document that even exists. A biblical, and when I back up, a biblical manuscript, when I use that word, it means a handwritten copy of the original bi bi biblical document, stuff that happened before printing presses. 
the originals, like I said, what the authors actually wrote, don't exist anymore, as far as we know. We haven't found them anyway if they did. In the New Testament, there are 5,800 Greek manuscripts of, these, of, of the scriptures. There's 19,200 19, in other languages, in other words, early translations. That's 24,900. Now that figure is probably more than that. That figure is a couple years old. And then the Old Testament, there's even more again of, of the Hebrew. This is just the New Testament. The earliest manuscript that we know of goes back to 50 AD. It's a fragment of the book of Mark. That would have been written, that fragment is less than 20 years from when the original uh, was actually penned, which is a very short period of time. The earliest complete manuscript, in other words, the complete book, is the complete book of, uh, what is that, the book of John, which is from about 200 AD, which is about 140 years after the original writing. Now that's extremely important to have early copies because as you get more and more copies, later and later down, older and older, you get more copying mistakes. You get way less copying mistakes in earlier ones, of course. So we have very early manuscripts that gives you a very good idea, again, what the original actually said. So what we have for the Bible is very, very close to the original writings. And there's enough of them that you can compare between them and see what really was what really would have been the original. We also have writings from the from early Christians, we call them the Christian fathers, who quoted the New Testament. And we have those from as early as about 95 AD. And these writings again can be compared to the actual manuscript. So there's piles and piles of stuff they can look at. Now if you think 20 to 200 years sounds like a long time, let's compare it to other ancient manuscripts. I, I actually say that it was the most strongly verified ancient document in existence. Well, how about Homer? There's a little uh, chart for you. Uh, Homer has the most manuscripts of any other ancient writer. There are 1,800 early copies, and the earliest one is 500 years after the original writing. If you look at it, it says who did the work, the date it was written, and then the earliest copies, and how many, the MS, MSS is how many manuscripts there are. That's the best one. Remember, the New Testament has 24,000 written within 20 years. That's a big, pretty big difference. The next one is Aristotle. 200 manuscripts, the earliest 1,400 years past the original. That's a really, really long time. And then it just goes downhill from there as far as numbers and time periods. When I said that the New Testament is the most strongly verified ancient document in existence, I wasn't kidding. It really is. We have absolute surety that what we have now, when we can pick up our Bible and read it, we have absolute surety that what we have now is accurate to the original writings. Archaeology is another aspect that comes in because it has given us many of these manuscripts. They dig them up all over the place and they realize, oh, hey, that's, that's actually the Bible or something. And they date it and they find these little scraps and sometimes they find more. But they have given us a lot of those manuscripts. They also give us backing as far as the historical accuracy of the Bible. When the Bible mentions a place name, did that place really exist? Did it exist in the place the Bible said it does? The places and events that happened, did they really happen? Did those events really happen? And many, many of these are confirmed by archaeology. Now, absolutely not the whole Bible has been substantiated, uh, but many things have been. And just as important, there has been nothing discovered archaeologically that has disproved the Bible that says, no, that was totally wrong. There has been absolutely nothing in that way. So although not everything has been found, everything that has been found does confirm that the Bible is accurate. One of the most compelling, beyond those things, and powerful evidences that the Bible is God's word, is fulfilled prophecy. God himself claims that he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's all-present, which means it's no big deal for him to tell something that's going to happen in the future. It's no problem for him to do that. 
God could obviously tell us with 100% accuracy what would happen in the future. And God does this in many, many places in the Bible. I think somebody estimated almost a third of the Old Testament is prophecy. And you'll see it in both short-term prediction and in long-term prediction. You'll see both of those things that are, that are happening. Short-term are things that would happen relatively soon, and you can actually see the fulfillments in the Scripture. Long-term, sometimes you see the fulfillments. Sometimes history shows you the fulfillments. And sometimes, some of those fulfillments have not even happened yet. But God obviously sets the standard for prophecy. He says that a person can know if a prophecy is actually from God. And you know by the fact that it's 100% accurate. And basically, if it doesn't come true, it's not from God. It's as simple as that. And I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 18, 20. And when you read that, notice that God gives the standard in the negative. In other words, he says, you know, here's the standard to know what the Lord has not spoken. Okay? Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how, shall we, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks, so here's the standard, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. So that is God's standard. That means that what has been, what has been spoken has to be true, and it has to happen. There cannot be even one mistake. And it doesn't take long when you read the Bible that you literally see fulfilled prophecy all over the place. Biblical prophecies, they're not like horoscopes, which are very, very general. Biblical prophecies are generally very specific, very exact. Sometimes giving names of people who don't even exist yet, and, and, or, or periods of time, and things like that, that are very exact. Um, the name of Cyrus, king of Persia, was given hundreds of years before he even lived. Uh, the name of Josiah the king was given by another prophet, and, and so on. I'm going to read from Zechariah 11, and this is a prophecy. I'm going to give you an example, just one example. And this is an example about Jesus. In Jesus' life, there were over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled when Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. 300 of them. I'm going to give you one of them that was fulfilled uh, by Judas Iscariot when he betrayed Jesus. Uh, you can find it in Matthew 26, 15, or Matthew 27, 9 and 10. Uh, I'm not going to read that section, but that's where you'll see what happened. Basically, Judas uh, betrayed Jesus. He felt remorse for it, and he was paid money by the priests to betray him. So he returned with the money and told them and, and said, um, man, I've done the wrong thing. And the priest said, sorry, that's not our problem, that's your problem. Too bad, buddy. So Judas just threw the money at them in the temple, went out and killed himself. And then the priest said, oh, man, we can't use this money for sacred purposes, so let's, let's use it to buy a graveyard for poor people. Uh, let's buy it from this guy over here who's a potter. And that, all those things fulfilled exactly the prophecy from Zechariah. I'm going to read that here for you. And then they said to them, If it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now they said, remember, prophecy here is very exact. 30 pieces, not 29, not 28, 30, and of silver, not gold, silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Throw it, don't hand it, don't place it, and it's specifically a potter. The lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Like I said, you can see that fulfillment in Matthew 27 with what Judas did. And that's just one example of some very exact fulfillment of prophecy, and that was written 500 years before Jesus was even born. But the importance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, of course, are central to the whole message of the Bible. And they show the fulfillment of God's eternal plan. And that's a hugely important thing, too. A plan that includes us as humans as being central to that plan. God cared enough to send Jesus as, both, as fulfillment, 
to God's prophecy and plan to forgive our sins and to fix the mess that we've made of our lives and, of, and the, the mess that this world is in. If we turn from our sin and put our trust in Jesus' death for us, that he paid for our sins on the cross and rose again to give us eternal life, he will forgive us our sins and make us his own people. The whole of the Bible shows God's plan from the beginning of creation right to the end. And when there will be right to the end, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and God's people will be with him. If the Bible is what God said it is, then we can completely trust him that these things will really happen, that these things are true. And of course, there, like I said, as far as prophecies go, there are prophecies which are even not yet to be fulfilled. We see them and they're not done yet. They're given as a long term. But we know that they're from God, because when we look at the other prophecies from that same prophet, the more short-term ones, we see them that they are fulfilled, that this was a true prophet from God. And so when we look at the long-term prophecies, we go, okay, we haven't seen fulfillment of this yet, but we will at some point. It's, so again, prophecy is a pretty powerful evidence of the fact that this Bible, this book, is from God and it's from authoritative because no one else can do that kind of thing. And we can fully trust our lives with what the Bible says. The Bible also stands up under science as well, just in general. It's not a scientific handbook. It's not written that way. In other words, there's not formulas there. There's not technical language. But what it has to say does not contradict science. It is accurate. But even being such an ancient document, I mean, like 2,000 years old, the newest parts of it, it still speaks correctly to things such as the earth being a sphere. Uh, speaks about the water cycle, about life as being in the blood of, of uh, everything that's living, and about the origin of the world by God's creation. If God's the originator of the Bible, then we can be sure that it is true to what is actually real, to what we see in front of us. And we can trust that all of, all of what Scripture says, even those parts that we may not understand yet, knowing that the rest of it is perfectly reliable. Now, in any of those categories that I just mentioned, all those different things, we could spend hours, days, and weeks studying all of it on just a superficial level. I mean, you look at prophecies, you look at uh, the textual criticism, all those things. Um, I mean, scholars do that for years and years and years. But the bottom line is, I, th I think we can hopefully see that we have a very good reason to trust, to trust the book, to trust the Bible, that it truly is God word, God's word, that it was said by Him, and that it carries His authority. And because of that, because of the truth that's in it, we can rely on it, that it is accurate to reality. So when it says that husbands or wives or children should treat each other in different, certain ways, really works. It really actually helps. When it tells us who God is and what he's like, we can trust that that's also true. And that God will do what he says, keeping his promises. His promises of care for his own people, for us. As well as promises for things like judgment for those who don't submit to him. In fact, we can so trust these facts and promises that we can give our very life to it. Even laying it down if we have to. What truth do you know that you would lay down your life for? Would you lay down your life to whether COVID is real or not real, or take a needle or not a needle? What truths would you lay down your life for? What do you know so absolutely sure that you would give your life for it? Remember, the Bible does claim to be God's true and authoritative word message to us. It is His word. And we can have complete confidence that what was written originally, we still have it. And we can look at things like the fulfilled scripts, prophecy, sorry, that show that God's word is just that. It is God's word. He spoke it and gives us total confidence that what God has also promised for us in the future will actually happen when we read stuff like the book of Revelation. And for our daily lives, of course, we can rely on its guidance and help for us to live a life that is truly satisfying, that is fulfilled, that is meaningful and productive lives that are pleasing to God. God's Word really does equip anyone who wants to follow God with the truth that we need. It equips us to teach, as uh, Timothy said, because we have a lot to learn. 
And it could helps us to correct because we make a lot of mistakes and we have a lot of wrong ideas. God's Word trains us how to live a truly godly life because we mess up our relationships in many different ways. Let me encourage you to do what Israel was encouraged to do with God's Word from the book of Deuteronomy so that we can learn to love God, Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. Deuteronomy 6, 5-9. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. All these words that I commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, the bottom line of what is he saying here is that we study, memorize the Bible so that you really know it. And then you will have his word in your heart, inside you, in your brain, on your mind. Teach it, discuss it, think about it. Remind yourself of God's word. So I challenge you, not to just say, eh, someday I'll read the Bible consistently, but make a commitment to discipline yourself, to make it a habit every day, to read it, to think about it. If you can, in any way you can, immerse yourself in God's Word. That's, his, that's what Deuteronomy is trying to tell us. Immerse ourselves in any way that we can in God's Word. Read it, listen to it on your phone. If you're curious about something you don't understand the Bible, look into it. And I don't mean just Google it, because you might find anything that way, but you might find good stuff. But find good resources that will help you understand something with God's Word. But practically, um, sorry, I'm losing my thought here. Um, I think so basically, practically, um, we just want to keep God's Word in front of us as ma in many ways that we possibly can. Because obviously as we go throughout our day, we can't be thinking about God's will all the time. We're thinking about things we're doing, our work, and things like that. But what he's trying to say is do it as often as you can, when you can. Because God's word is worth it. It's worth doing that. Because it is just that. The Bible really is God's word. It's what God said to us. It's his message. It has his authority. And so we need to know it. And more importantly, of course... We need to do what it says. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, I thank you, even with my mumbling and stuff, I hope people can see and understand that your word really is just that. It is your word that you have specially given to us so that we can know who you are, that we can know who you have made us to be and how you would have us to live and how we could be pleasing to you and who Jesus is and how he was sent um, to take care of our sin problem, of our problem that we deserve your judgment, but yet we can be forgiven. We can be made your people, your children, and live for you. So thank you for these things. Thank you for how powerful your word is. Thank you for all that you give to us. Father, today is Thanksgiving Day, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for everything else in life that you give because you are just good. You are a good God. You are a loving God. And we thank you for all that you give. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.